In the name of the National Latino Behavioral Health Association, the National Hispanic and Latino Addiction and Prevention Technology Transfer Centers, we welcome you. My name is Priscilla Giamassi, and I am the project coordinator for the National Hispanic and Latino PTTC. We welcome you to the first session of a three-part series titled Understanding, Going Through, and Managing Loss, Grief, and Bereavement. Life with the COVID pandemic for Latinos with a view on Latino men. I will be your host for today's presentation. Next slide, please. Before we introduce you to our amazing presenter, here are some brief instructions about our event. We want to disclose our grant information. You will receive a copy of those slides and you can read the entire information at your own convenience. On the next slide, we're gonna share some housekeeping items. You will receive a copy of today's presentations like I mentioned before. Uh, this session is being recorded, so we will uh, provide you the recording afterwards. The lines will be muted throughout the presentation so we can minimize background noise. When we get to the question and answers portions of our webinar, you will be able to ask your questions to our presenter by clicking on the Q&A box and we will share your questions to our presenter. Uh, we will be asking you to fill out a brief survey at the end of this webinar. The satisfaction evaluation is very important to the work that we do and gives us the opportunity to improve our training efforts. And you will also be receiving a certificate of attendance uh, via email after today's webinar. Uh, on the next slide, we just wanna take a moment and reflect on the power of words and remind you that together we can use our words to create positive change. We wanna share with you as well the TTTC network map with information about addiction, prevention and the mental health technology transfer centers. Each network is comprised of 10 regional centers and three national centers, the network and coordinating offices, the National American Indian and Alaska Native TTCs, and the National Hispanic and Latino TTCs. So our centers have a national focus for Hispanic and Latino communities and the workforce that provides services to these communities. Now, on the next slide, please allow me to introduce you to our parent organization, the National Latino Behavioral Health Association, NALBA. NALBA is a nonprofit and is located in New Mexico with the mission to influence national behavioral health policy, to eliminate disparities in funding and access to services, and to improve the quality of services and treatment outcomes for Latino populations. We have some objectives and policy priorities that we would like to share with you. Select capa selected capacity expansion of mental health services for Latinos, Latino behavioral health evidence-based practices, legislation to increase the number of behavioral health professionals, funding for co-occurring disorders of alcohol and substance abuse, opioid crisis in Latino community and suicide prevention. On the next slide, we just wanna take this opportunity to invite you to join us on the 2022 National Latino Behavioral Health Conference, Latino Behav Behavioral Health Equity, Juntos Podemos. It is happening in September 15 and 16 at the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. This conference will provide a forum for behavioral health professionals from different areas to connect exchange ideas and together explore the best practices to attend the Hispanic and Latino communities. I'll ask my colleagues to share the conference website on the chat so you can take a look and learn more about this incredible event that we are organizing to support our communities. On the next slide, you're gonna see our amazing team. We are staffed by Dr. Susie Villalobos. She is serving as the project director of both centers. I'm working as a project coordinator for the National Hispanic and Latino PTTC, alongside with my colleague, Cristina Mancebo Torres, who is the program specialist of our center. And Ana Chavez Mancillas just joined us recently, and she is working as the program specialist for the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC. Now it's time to introduce our presenter. Elizabeth works in the El Paso region as a behavioral health care professional specializing in life changes, trauma, grief, and loss. She is certified in thanatology through the Association of Death Education Counseling. Elizabeth brings to her practice a profound understanding of death, 
coupled with grounding in neuroscience. Her treatment approach offers patients the hope and strat strategies to facilitate continuous emotional renewal in face of life's constant changes. She is also the founder of the Facebook group Aki on Death as a bacotral space where people can learn and share their unique perspectives about death and grieving. In addition to her private practice, Elizabeth serves as the clinical director for the Mano and Corazon Institute of Integrative Health, an El Paso nonprofit organization which advocates for body, mind, spirit approaches to well-being. In 2020, Elizabeth became a certified end-of-life doula. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for your availability to share your knowledge and your expertise with us. I already had the opportunity to attend some of your training sessions and you're just amazing. So thank you again. Please feel free to start your presentation. Buenas tardes, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you specifically to NALBA, to ATCC, PTCC for this opportunity to present and to work with you all. Uh, as uh, Priscilla just mentioned, thank you for that introduction, Priscilla. Uh, I think the issue and the, the thoughts of bereavement, loss, and grief are one of the most prevalent things in our society today for everything that we already know that has happened in our planet. And I find that it is a, it is a sometimes difficult topic because death brings about so many different things, but it's important to talk about it. And I'm very grateful and I'm very excited to be here with you all in this first part of this three-part series. So let's talk a little bit about the overarching phenomena of death and what that means, its universality and the personal intimate component that these uh, particular events represent for us. Universality is the death of death, excuse me, is the understanding that all living things must eventually die. And it's important that we keep that concept in our mind, not as a negative connotation or as a depressing connotation, if you will, but as understanding that things transform, things change, things come to a period in which they evolve. And, you know, we do this every day. Right now, we're, we could say, almost looking at the end of summer here in the next month or so, month and a half, and we already see the changes, but we're in summer. And we know that when it comes to the seasons, for example, autumn is going to come and the leaves start falling and they start changing color and transforming until in winter they die and they go into a different state of life or non-existence. And so we know that in our human experience, the universality of the fact that things transform and change is a constant for us. And so that's something that we cannot avoid. And it is reversible because we have not yet, with as much technology and medical advancements as we have, we have not yet been able to conquer the fact that when something stops, especially when it's something that is organic and biological, such as a being or a tree or an animal or anything like that, when it, when it finishes and it ends that particular type of death, that physical death, it is not reversible. It is irreversible. And again, we've had major strides in science and, and medicine, but we have not yet been able to conquer that because there is a, a certain part of that cycle that cannot come back. I also see death very often in the issues of bereavement and grief, like that Nautilus chamber, that once it closes its chamber, it doesn't go back. It continues to transform and it continues to change. And I find that phenomena deep and profound, but also very real and very common for us. The individual experiences of grief that each of us are going to have, they're going to be influenced by the nature of the losses that we experience and by the individual's particular traits. So who we are and what we live through is going to be a major decision factor on how these losses or these changes, if you will, are going to impact us. We'll go to the next slide here. And so let's talk a little bit about specifically the language of grief and talking about loss when it comes to people. We know that there's multiple losses and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in uh, the few further slides. But loss is essentially a change of something that is no longer. Whether it's a, a loved one, whether it's a pet, whether it's a job, a physical condition, a way of life, um, a transition, 
or a certain part of our lifespan that we go from one space to another. When we graduate from high school, we are no longer that person. Now we're going to go into another space. When we, you know, when we leave our parents and we start kindergarten or first grade, there is a loss and a change there. That doesn't mean it's negative or difficult, but no less, it is a change. So loss is essentially that that is no longer because something else has come about. Grief is a very specific term that I like to talk about because it is the natural reaction that we will all have to loss. And it's very specific because there's times that we will have a very intense natural reaction, like I'm talking about losing a loved one, for example, versus maybe losing the fact that I wake up in the morning and there's a little silver hair on the top of my head. Well, that hair no longer has a pigmentation. The loss is not as intense, but it has changed. When we grieve, which is the natural reaction of that, it is going to differ because of the intensity of that loss, because of what that loss means to us. And each of us are gonna be different. There is no exact grief, but I guarantee you, and understanding this as a thanatologist, everyone in some point of their life will grieve because it's a natural part of the process of this existence that we have. And bereavement, bereavement is the period or the time of grief and the morning after that death. So if you will, bereavement is truly a verb, it's an action word. We will all be grieved, but we can all choose whether we want to be bereaved or to bereave or not. And obviously as a mental health specialist and professional, I encourage you to take the time to bereave your losses, to acknowledge them, to honor them, not only for what has changed, again, specifically to the fact that we lose a loved one, but because of you, because life and death are part of us every day. Every day, it is part of who we are and we live and we come into this world knowing, maybe not at that moment where we're you know, infants and we're just newborns, but we come knowing that at some point, change is going to be inevitable. So those are the big changes. Grief, or well, the big words, grief is the natural reaction to the loss and the bereavement is the action of acknowledging that. Next slide. So when it comes to the symptoms of bereavement and grief and, and loss and all these terms that kind of bunch up together, I think it's important for all of us to recognize that as human beings, as sentient beings, we're going to, again, experience loss in a very different way depending on who we are. But I think it's important to recognize and to learn that each of us, because we're different, we may have um, experience, we may experience different symptoms based on who we are. And some people may be very bereaved and very grieved in a physical way, others more emotional, others more cognitive or more thinking, and others more spiritual. So let me give an example. When we are physically grieving, you're going to have maybe perhaps possibly a sense of tiredness and exhaustion, loss of appetite, or perhaps maybe being very hungry. Um, sensitivity to various stimuli, for example, uh, noise and, and a lot of crowds and big spaces. And it may be like too much at that point because the person is physically feeling like they cannot do this right now. The body is not in a space to do that. Muscular tension, uh, lack of energy, shortness of breath, tightness in the chest, nausea, uh, the, the, the immune system tends to drop sometimes weight gain or loss, physical pain, as I mentioned earlier, I think, insomnia, a difficulty concentrating, and sometimes an increased or a diminished libido, depending on who the person is. These are not all the physical symptoms that bereavement, grief, and loss bring about, but they're certainly very common ones. And I always tell people in my private practice, when I have someone there who is going through a grief process or a grief journey, be sure and check in with a doctor, make an appointment, and say, you know, maybe I need some lab work. I want to tell you that I lost a loved one a week ago, two weeks ago, my mother, my father, my uncle, whoever it was. It's important to tend to your medical aspect just to make sure everything's okay. And if not, let's tend to it. But these are very natural responses that people tend to have. Of course, if there's something that is consistent and you see a pattern, we always urge people to seek medical attention. Now, in terms of emotions, 
you know, which is different. That's not what I actually feel physically, but how do I feel in my mood? How do I feel in my affect? And sometimes we can have feelings of guilt. That's a very, very common and very natural response to death. Uh, feelings of intense pain and shock because we just learned about this loss. Uh, anger, anger is also very common. As we know, there's experts in these types of um, topics and, and different models. And we know that one of them I wanna mention is Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was one of the first pioneers. And she says there was five stages. There's probably a lot more stages, but one of them was anger. One of them was um, shock. The other was disbelief. So all these are emotional reactions that we have. Fear, fear is one of the most common and perhaps subconscious method, um, ways that the body, that the mind, that the emotions are going to feel this death, are going to experience this death because there is so much uncertainty. When someone dies, there's a lot that we're gonna start doing in a complete different way because that person is no longer physically with us. So when we see this, it can be daunting. It can be very scary. It can be very anxiety driven because we don't have the answers to how are we gonna adapt at that moment. At that moment, we are saturated with emotional pain. We are saturated with un unawareness and un the unknowing of what is gonna happen next. And so fear is a very, very common and natural reaction to this journey. Sadness, you know, being sad, being melancholic, feeling a level of depression that is not clinical depression, but as depression based on this loss are also very important emotional traits that we see. Not being able to understand what happened. You know, you, you just can't come to grips with that. People struggle with that sometimes. And it could be for various reasons. Uh, depression, as I mentioned, irritability, anger, it kind of goes along with the impatience as well. Shame, shame is very common. Anxiety, how am I going to face the rest of my life? Uh, loneliness, yearning perhaps, lack of control. Numbness is also another one and resentment. And I want to make a little caveat here from the physical, emotional, as we go on to the co cognitive, but I want to briefly talk about something that we call grief attacks. And grief attacks are this physical, perhaps emotional reaction that we have when we're kind of going through the day and we feel like we're getting back and adapting to life. And all of a sudden you're in the grocery store and you hear the song and it floods you with emotions and you just remember that loved one and you just it just, it's like, like grief just took over you and it attacked you almost. And it's not that it's a bad thing. It's just that it comes out of nowhere and they can happen at any time, at any place, at any circumstance. And it's a grief attack. So be aware that when those things happen, you're not regressing. It's not something that is hurting us or that we're not doing well in this journey. It happens. The mind, the body, everything is going to go through this incredible transition when we're dealing with bereavement and loss. So let's talk now about cognitive, the thought process. What is it that affects me sometimes when I'm thinking about the fact that I am undergoing this journey of grief, that I'm devastated, that I'm very sad, that I don't know how things are gonna come to some normality, if we will. So we perhaps may be in disbelief. I know that a lot of the events that have happened lately in our country, in our society, have us just disbelief. And, you know, it's just hard to wrap our minds around the fact that this particular situation happened. Uh, obsessive thinking, obsessive thinking about the person that died, about the circumstances, about our behavior, maybe about the behavior of someone else, but that constant thinking. Apathy or numbness. A lot of people I have seen that just go into the space of, I don't even know what I can feel. I don't even think I can feel right now because I feel so saturated, so flooded, so overtaken by this particular loss. So numbness is also a very, very natural reaction when it, when it goes to what am I thinking and how am I feeling? Uh, looping, looping thinking and continuous thoughts of what if scenarios. So what if we hadn't gone on that trip? What if I would have gotten to the hospital? What if we would have been to the doctor? What if I wouldn't have left the house? What, would I wouldn't have, what if I wouldn't have given that person permission to go out to that party? What if, what if, what if? The reality is that if we knew the future, 
first of all, I think we could move past our present because we'd be so busy and so overwhelmed, but we don't know the future. The future is something that does not exist right now. What exists right now is this present moment and this ability for me to communicate with you and present to you these very important things that I hope serve a purpose, but I don't know what comes next. I don't know what comes next in the next hour, needless to say the next three or later in the afternoon or the evening or tomorrow or in 10 years from now. But the what ifs take us to scenarios that say, what if I would have done this, then my loved one would be alive. And quite frankly, we will never have that answer because the what if doesn't exist. So whenever you are going through a journey of bereavement, be sure and tell yourself the what if is something that really is not I can, something I can control because we cannot, it doesn't exist. Lack of motivation and focus, disorientation and confusion are very common when somebody is grieving. So keep those things in mind. And spiritually, which is the last that I have posted here, is that connection perhaps that people have very individual, very personal, very private to a higher self, to a higher power. And maybe they question that higher power because how could God, for example, have taken my child? How could God have allowed this to happen? And so there is a level of bereavement that is very spiritual in nature for people sometimes. Negative feelings towards a higher power. I had a situation one time in which a lady you know, was attending sessions uh, for therapy. And she explained to me that she was very angry at God. She had been a very good human being all her life as best as she could. She loved her son. She, she raised him well, and she was a, a God believer. And so why would God take her child away from her? Why would God kill her son? Whether she was wrong or right is really irrelevant. The point here is that she was feeling this emotional, physical, perhaps cognitive, and now spiritual reaction to her bereavement. Negative feelings, again, about our spiritual community. Sometimes the community that is uh, religious in nature, maybe they have certain expectations or they see death in a certain place and a certain way. And the person who is actually going through the bereavement may, may not feel that way. So there's a disconnect, separation from our own feelings and beliefs, misunder feeling misunderstood by a spiritual religious community. Those are all very, very common scenarios in which people grieve in a spiritual way. So my question to you when we finish this um, webinar and when you have time to be by yourself is ask yourself, what kind of griever are you? Are you a physical griever, an emotional, a thinking, cognitive kind of griever, or a spiritual? Or maybe you're all four. I can tell you I'm a very physical griever. I usually catch cold, I usually get a stomach ache, I usually feel very nervous, I feel very antsy. And so it's emotional and physical. Some people may be very different. So you ask yourself, because the more you know, how is it that you grieve? How is it that you go through this process, especially initially, that will help you understand that what you're going through is not abnormal, is not wrong, but it's the process. It's this whole entity, it's this whole phenomenon that has taken a part in our lives. Let's go on to the next slide. One before, great, thank you. So let's identify our losses. A person will experience a multitude of losses throughout their lifespan, and these will differ in value, importance, and relevance to each individual. So some person can say, I don't know why so-and-so is making a big deal, their cat died. I mean, I understand, I'm sorry for the cat, but big deal. We cannot measure loss in terms of the value that we may put to a circumstance. We have to see that really when we identify it, we identify that that person may be having that loss. And it could be their cat, their dog, their parrot, their boat. It could be their friend. It could be the refrigerator that stopped working. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that everyone is going to put a certain value and a level of importance and relevance to that loss. And that's what matters. That's what's important for each of us. And sometimes we fall into these moments of, oh, I'm sorry you went through that, but let me tell you what's happened to me. And, and what's happened to me is important, but that person needs a little more of, I'm sorry for what you're going through. So that makes them feel more validated, more understood. And it's hard because we have difficulty expressing, how can I help you when you're going through this time? 
but the more we understand that a person can can feel and put value into a loss that is very individual, I think the more it helps us understand and identify those losses and helps them as well when they're going through this journey. Next slide. The potential impact each loss has on a person. And I have to put potential because again, the sky's the limit. It's really the universe is the limit because it's limitless. And it sounds a little controversial because how can loss, how can death, how can my pain have potential? But if we think about it, when we experience loss, this change, it opens the door to an opportunity for each one of us to grow, to come to terms with, again, that universal sense of loss for all of us that we will all in encounter change, transformation, death, loss, and that we each will intimately and personally have the opportunity to work understanding that life is constantly changing. Life is constantly changing for all of us. That doesn't mean that it's gonna take the pain from the fact that maybe we don't have someone in our lives physically anymore, but at least it gives us the understanding that again, as living organisms, we will perish our physical form at some point and others around us as well. So it's very important to keep this in mind because it gives us a bit of a perspective when we're trying to separate ourselves from so much pain because the pain is natural and the pain is out of love. It's out of the fact that we feel this pain for ourselves. The person who has now died, depending on what we all believe, they are no longer living, they're no longer suffering, maybe they're in a better place, but we are the ones who are left behind. We cry for ourselves. We cry for the pain that we're going through. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we also need to find solace and to move forward. Because change is constant. And we do not measure loss by the level of the impact, but by how each person will move in their individual loss. If you take anything from this webinar, please take this. It is not what happens to us that defines us. It is what we do with that, that helps us define who we are and we get to make that decision. So each loss is going to be defined how we choose because it's intimate and personal to us. And we wanna respect that from each other so that we can support each other in these processes. But yes, uh, yet understand that each of us are gonna feel different based on a number of things. And they're all gonna be different variants that are gonna affect everyone. See, the thing about loss and bereavement and grief is that it seems like a straight line. This has ended, this person has died, but there's nothing further from the truth. There is no diagram, there is no cookie cutter, there is no straight line. Every human being will experience this in a totally different manner. The undeniable truth is that loss and death will change each, each of us. And it's gonna be depend, it's gonna depend on, on us if we're gonna get this opportunity, we're gonna take this opportunity and grab it and say, as much as this is difficult. I will move through this and I will grow and I will honor and I will change and adapt. And maybe I'm going to live and honor that person's memory. And I'm going to find some solace and understanding that this process is natural, but it does hurt. And we would never minimize that change, but we can, for the most part, get through it. Next slide. Identifying the multiple ways that an individual can grieve. There are many factors that matter in which each person will assimilate or not, you know, any type of loss. But these factors that influence this experience and these dynamics are all gonna vary, as I said. They include, but they're not limited in how we're going to go through this process by our childhood experiences, by our culture, our worldview, based sometimes and most often on that culture and how we identify uh, in the world, our views, our norms, our traditions, our fears, our strengths, and our personal views on life and death. And I've met many people who say, I never wanna talk about death. I don't wanna bring it upon me. I don't wanna bring that subject. I don't wanna hear it. I don't wanna talk about it. I don't want it close to me, put it on the other side, get away from it, I understand. But that makes it even more difficult for each of us to come to terms to the fact that life, as I mentioned earlier, is ever changing. And ever changing is transformation. Transformation sometimes will 
bring about that loss. See, today when we go to sleep, we're not going to be the same person as I wake up tomorrow because time has passed and change has occurred. So it's ever, it's ever constant. And because it's constant, we need to understand that each of us, based on who we are and these points that I just made, our traditions, our cultura, especially for us Latinos that are, have this innate passion for life, it's difficult sometimes to embrace the concept of the fact that a loved one will not be with us. But we have to move forward and we have to try to find ways to move forward. Next slide. The difference between grief and traumatic grief, and one of the reasons why I wanted to be very specific and give its time and moment to these two terms is because the focus of these three series, these three part series is to talk about the losses that we have incurred as a society with COVID-19, the pandemic that is still very much ongoing. It's still alive and it's still part of our lives in every aspect. And that traumatic grief is something that we're seeing and it's very common. So I will get into more and more detail about that as we continue. But remember, grief is the result of any loss a person may experience. The difference is that traumatic grief results from a loss that is unexpected and it triggers a certain level of post-trauma survival mechanisms in, in ourselves. And that is where our brain and I'm not going to go too much into this, but the limbic system, our survival system tends to say something happened, something happened very bad and somebody's life or my life or our existence was threatened. And I, uh, I'm, I'm very impacted by that. So in addition to the mourning, there was an unexpected loss. And there's another thing that I have to mention, which is a presentation for another day, but the mass shootings in our country have become so prevalent and so shocking that they bring about also a lot of traumatic grief. So we're a, a society that is looking at traumatic grief from different sources. One, the overarching impact of the pandemic that we're all living with, and two, these certain situations such as the mass shootings and other things that can also be circumstances that can bring traumatic loss to us or traumatic grief. So it's important that we identify this term so that we also understand that not just this journey of bereavement and loss and grief, which is very natural and yet not necessarily easy for us, can be impacting our life, but that there may be a traumatic component. And that is when we always encourage people to seek your health, your mental health professionals, to seek to talk to someone. Make sure that you're taking care of your well being, because the more you understand and learn about this, the more empowered and stronger you're going to feel to be able to bring in your internal resources to this process and to move not just through the journey of grief, but also anything else that may be affecting us. Next slide. So options that help us move through these moments of so much pain, of so much emotional change, so much cognition of what am I gonna do now? So much physical, how do I feel? And I feel like everything hurts, like I can't move. So self-care is very important. And self-care, I think there's a misunderstanding about the fact that we think self-care is go to the spa and take, you know, go hiking to Mount Everest and do all these cool things and you'll be better. And self-care is taking 10 minutes for yourself a day and just regrouping with yourself, going inside of you. Some people meditate, some people pray. Self-care could mean I'm not going to be able to attend the get together that you had invited me because I, I'm not up to it right now. I'm not ready. Thank you, but I won't be there. So boundaries and limits help us with self-care, but self-care is saying, what is it that I need to take care of myself? And that's going to vary depending on who each of us are. Maybe I should go to the party. Maybe it's going to distract me. It just depends on who we are. Sleep. It is important that we have an adequate amount of sleep. And there's a lot of different sleep patterns and sleep hours for the persons, for each person, excuse me, depending on who we are and our age. But for the most part, we need to sleep about seven to nine hours a day for adults in general. We have a sleep deprived society. Our children are sleep deprived, we are sleep deprived, and we feel that because we have to continue work and continue checking emails and doing this and doing that, that we do not take enough time to recover and to go into a state of balance in our body of homeostasis through the process of sleep. 
So please make sure to check your sleep cycles. Please make sure to check your sleep patterns and your hygiene of what you do to prepare to sleep and get adequate rest and sleep when you are in front of a loss of bereavement process and journey. Work, we need to continue. We need to continue doing what usually works for us. Perhaps we need to curtail some things and adapt because there are some changes, but it is very important that we continue a certain routine for us because that helps us. And it keeps us in a way of saying, this is something I know, this is something I can do, this is something that actually helps me. Diet, it goes without saying, you know, be careful with some of the choices that we all make. Hydration is critical, you know, very important. Some exercise, some walk, you know, maybe do something that'll help you. Right now with summer, we know that the swimming pools are a fun place to be. And alone time is important because we need that. And maybe we also need to grieve alone and to have that good cry or to have that, you know, cry and then maybe sleep a little and then wake up and maybe just eat a fruit or something that is not a full plate of meal, but that makes us feel better. And we can just kind of soothe ourselves through this and grieving with others. Alone time is very important, but together time is just as vital. And if we have that opportunity, make that happen. I can't begin to tell you as a, as a uh, private practitioner, how many times I sit with families and the little kids say, well, I go to sleep and I cry myself to sleep because I don't want my mom or my dad or my grandma to see me crying because I'm still missing my loved one. And then I talk to mom or grandma or whoever it is that's taking care of them or dad, et cetera. And they tell me, well, I cry when the children don't see me because I don't want them to get upset. But there's nothing that's going to make us more upset than what we're already dealing with, with a loss of that person. So grieve together, cry together, laugh together, remember together. Ask yourselves, how are we going to handle this new thing that didn't happen before? Because dad would take care of doing it or mom or whoever it is. Grieving with others is a way to come together and grow and move forward with this journey. And so is grieving alone. So it's that's why I explained earlier, it's not like it's going to be one cookie cutter thing. Bereavement and loss are just like, a, like an ocean that has different waves and different impact. And it's going to bring about one shape and another shape. And the more we give into this and understand that it is truly a journey for us, the easier it becomes to deal with the daily, almost sometimes minute by minute um, experiences that we're having. But don't forget to grieve by yourself and don't forget to grieve with others. Give yourself the opportunity to not feel okay. I'm not up to it today. I'm frustrated. I can't find my place. I can't seem to be okay going or coming or being or I just, I'm not comfortable. So perhaps the best thing for do is for me to be in my room for a while. And then maybe I'll come out and watch some TV if I feel up to it. And maybe I'll flip to the channels and then I don't want it. So then I'll turn on the radio or I'll go outside. It's okay not to feel okay. We live in a society that all of us don't want to see others not doing well. So we want to shake them out of it. Come on, you'll be all right. Echale ganas, we say in Spanish. Come on, give it all your will. But the truth of the matter is that we need, as human beings, we need the time to acknowledge and kind of absorb and work through these very important changes when we lose someone. And so we need those times to say, I'm not up to it today. Thank you so much. Maybe tomorrow. Or I don't feel good. Maintaining healthy boundaries. That is what that's all about. I appreciate the invitation, but I think I'm only going to stay two hours instead of five. I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and take my car like that. If I need to leave, I'll go ahead and do it. Perhaps today is not the day that I'm going to sign up for a 10-week course because I'm not up to it. Maybe I'm gonna wait for the next session, et cetera. Know your limits, know your boundaries. Doesn't mean you have to be secluded and isolated, but only you are gonna know what's best for you and how much time you can invest into that circumstance. So knowing how it is that you grieve and bereave, as I talked about earlier, having those boundaries and following a few things that help you manage this is going to be very useful. Next slide. I can't say it any easier. Loss, grief, and bereavement are just not easy. They're not impossible. They can be devastating. But truly, truly, I can tell you that for the most part, the majority of people, we can work through this, but it's not an easy road. 
And just like this image, it looks daunting, it looks foggy, and it looks very lonely at times. But the more we work at this, there does come a point where the fog dissipates and the light comes. And we see the plane and the path and everything else so much clearer. And I wish that for all of you, but I know that each of us has our time. So we'll continue working on that. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about pandemic loss, as I said, and let's start focusing as we are kind of, we started very wide and we're narrowing this presentation in the next two to come. And let's talk about pandemic loss, grief and trauma and the unprecedented numbers, you know, the volume of death in the United States and in the world. So COVID death in the United States of America since it began to about last week when I saw these numbers was about a million, a million 11,000 change. And the statistics tell us, especially from the Center for Disease Con and Control, tell us that about nine people for every one person that has died will be bereaved. I think that is accurate. I have no reason to doubt it. I didn't do the research on that. I read the research. But I have to tell you that as, as a Chicana woman, as a Latina woman, I don't know that nine is enough. Because typically, our Latino families, we are very large and our friends become family. And we have a very extended group that we consider our family. And so I don't know that it's nine. I would like to say that it's minimally between the high teens, like 17 to 22, because I truly, truly believe that we are just in a very different way of seeing the world and who our relationships are. Our relations are. So culturally, I hate to say, but I think the numbers are higher. But if we're looking at about a million and change of people who have been impacted by COVID only and not all other deaths, we're looking that in our country, we have about 9 million people who are suffering the loss of a loved one to the pandemic. And this is across the board. But again, I think that for our communities, the numbers are larger. And in the worldwide level, globally, we're looking at about 6.3 losses just on COVID. And if we have that and we multiply it times nine, we end up with set 57 million people, 57 million people today saying, I have lost a loved one to this pandemic. Do we have work to do for ourselves so that our healing, so that our continuous sense of living helps us and we can all work with each other? Absolutely. Do we need to show our children how important it is to be in a natural process of understanding that the journey of grief is all right, that being bereaved is okay so that they can have the strength to continue to deal with challenges in life? Absolutely. So the more we learn about this, the more we empower ourselves, the more you offer to yourself and to everybody else around you, to our families, to our communities. Next slide, please. Pandemic impact amongst Latinos. So during the pandemic, Hispanics have been at a higher risk of hospitalization and death from COVID-19 than any other racial and, racial and ethnic group in our country. This is in part due to the large numbers who have very little access to healthcare and have jobs that put them at greater risk and exposure to the virus. And we have seen the numbers, we know they continue to grow. This is not a new thing that we're not aware of, but we have to understand that the Latino community, we need to make very specific steps. We need to be very aware that self-care during pandemic is critical is critical for ourselves and is critical for our loved ones because our numbers are staggering. And we know that we have issues of disparities and those health disparities impact us directly to these numbers. And there isn't sometimes the availability to say, I'm gonna stay home and work, or I'm actually not going to work, or I'm gonna go and just walk into an emergency room and be taken care of because sometimes those disparities do not allow us. So you being, invested in your self-care during this pandemic and your self-care in general is something that we all win. It's a win-win for all of us as a society. And I encourage you to consider that and to take steps towards it. Next slide. 
So half of the United States Hispanics say someone close to them has either been hospitalized or has died from COVID. Half, 50%, a little bit more of Latinos and Hispanics. 50% of adults in the United States say a family member or a close friend living in the US or in another country, maybe the country of origin for the family has been hospitalized or died. So the number is very really exact, 52. If not, perhaps a little more because we always have to consider the unreported numbers. 28% of Latinos say they have either tested positive, 28% tested positive for antibodies of um, COVID, or they are pretty sure because they didn't get tested. The pretty sure is I went through this experience and I'm pretty sure that even though they didn't get tested, they had a positive COVID result. Over 62% of Latinos either have had COVID themselves, 62% is incredibly large, or have a relative or a close friend that not only got it, but that has been hospitalized or unfortunately passed away. The numbers are alarming to this day. We are not through with this pandemic. A pandemic typically lasts between three to seven years and we're just entering our third year. Your self-care is critical, mi gente. Your self-care impacts your families, your communities, our jobs, our stability, and we all have to take the lead to care for ourselves so we can lead for, other, for others because you are so important, because you matter so much, because the losses are so high and it's gonna take a while for all of us to continue and, and work through this journey, but yet brief and know that we're gonna get through this somehow, but it's gonna take every single one of us. That's the importance of today. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about some terms that I find very important regarding pandemic and the types of griefs because not every grief will be the same and not every type of grief. I just spoke about traumatic grief earlier and now we're gonna look at collective grief. And that is where a community, a society, a village, a nation or here the world experiences extreme change or loss. And so we know that every one of us as a humanity is dealing with collective grief some way, somehow. I have found very few people, perhaps not even a handful, just a little pick of people that have told me, I fortunately have not been aware of anyone that has been um, affected to the point that they have died because of the pandemic. But I do know a lot of people that say, yeah, I know people who have had the, the COVID or have been themselves sick. But it's just a, a little bit, I see just a tiny bit that say, I have no one that I know that has died from COVID-19. And I think that's wonderful. Cumulative grief may occur. This is another term. When an individual experiences multiple losses, either all at once or before processing an earlier loss. So again, I don't want to go a lot into detail because it's another presentation about the mass shootings, but there we see multiple losses. I live in El Paso, Texas. We have, had, we have been victims of a terrorist attack of that nature, and there was multiple losses, not just unfortunately by the people who um, were affected directly and died and lost their lives, but just everything else that comes with it. In this case, when you're looking at COVID-19 and the pandemic, there's multiple losses, changes in systems, changes in infrastructure, changes in availability, changes in economics, changes in healthcare, changes in our, in our behavioral health. So we need to know that cumulative grief may come very stacked, a lot of different things, and then that it impacts us because it becomes overwhelming. So we need to care for the self and know that the more we can kind of organize and control ourselves, then the more we are available to progress, to move forward and to get through all this. Disenfranchised grief is when your grieving doesn't fit with your larger society's attitude about dealing with death and loss. So a lot of times we hear someone say, I lost my son, I lost my spouse, I lost my child, and it's devastating. But it's not very often that we say a sister perhaps is grieving their brother, or maybe a circumstance of a stillbirth, for example. And the person, the woman can go through this bereavement, but we kind of feel like, well, you know, the baby didn't come to terms, it didn't happen, I'm so sorry, but you're going to go on, it's going to be great, it's going to be fine, you can move forward, you can have other children, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. People don't try to be insensitive, 
but sometimes it can come off as being insensitive, but that disenfranchised grief is society doesn't really see it as this major loss as compared to other losses, and we have a hard time identifying it. So it doesn't fit in the larger attitude of the losses. So somebody can say, well, I lost my house during COVID. Yeah, but you know, so-and-so lost 10 family members. Well, again, we don't want to measure. There's nothing to measure. The impact is going to vary. But so that person is feeling a level of disenfranchisement because we're not really understanding that the attitude here is you lost your house. That's a big deal. And it's a big deal. This person lost 10 family members, but loss is loss. And it doesn't quantify based on what matters more or what matters less. Next slide, please. The assault of fear upon the face of death. And so here it's about, for many of us, thinking about death and how it evokes, again, how I mentioned earlier, the sense of separation, of loss, of pain, suffering, uh, anxiety, and about leaving those that, that they're leaving us behind. It is a very natural, natural thing to hear of people pondering of their own mortality when they go through a loss, when, they, uh, when that loss is especially of a very close loved one. Your losses are going to be based, a lot of times, the impact of that loss is going to be based on the relationship you had with that person. The closer the relationship, the more it's going to hurt. That's why pets are such profound losses, because we adore pets. They give us unconditional love. And so somebody can say, well, it's not a human being. Well, it's not a human being, but it's our love pets. And we love our pets, right? And so that fear of death, that fear of that uncertainty clenches at us, especially in the beginning. Many times loss brings us to reflect on thoughts and questions and attitudes about life, about our purpose, about the reason for our existence on and how we moved on. And throughout humanity, throughout the existence of us as humans, we've always pondered on our purpose, on our reason for existence. And I happen to feel that every single one of us has a very important purpose in this life. I don't care what you do, I don't care what you like, I don't care what it is that matters to you. It's respectable. It is important. It is about you. So when we have this assault of fear upon us because of the loss of someone, realize that it makes sense. But as we move through that and we choose to bereave, that fear will start gently dissipating as we adapt and we move forward. Next slide, please. Nos reímos en la huesuda, or do we? We laugh at death. Or do we laugh at death? You know, in our cultura as Latinos, you know, we call death so many things, la huesuda, you know, the bony one, or la calaca, la flaca, the skinny one. You know, we have so many, so many different names to call death, and we personify death. And in our cultura, we have things like Day of the Dead, and we have these profound and beautiful rituals and ceremonies that get us to understand. There's a very famous writer, Octavio Paz, who wrote of, uh, who's a Nobel Prize winner and who wrote about um, the faces that we handle death with. Las Mascaras Mexicanas, as he mentioned, the, the Mexican masks. And the fact that in his book, he talks about how we use these masks, these masks of everything is okay. I'm doing fine. I don't have a problem. I'm gonna get through this. But at the end of the day, do we really laugh at death? And I think laugh, I think death, excuse me, needs to be as revered and as honored and as understood as life because it is our ultimate and last transition. Maybe we come back, maybe we don't. There's a lot of different, you know, theories on that, and I respect them all. But at the end of the day, what lives will perish at some point. And while we can laugh at it, I think the bigger message here is let us live. Let us have a life well lived, as we say, because every minute counts, because it is so important, because it is so sacred, because we love, because we have passion and intensity and we make things happen and we engage with others and we love. And all the process of bereavement and grief and loss can be so intricate, so intricate. But at the end of the day, I think the human emotion and the need for being part of and giving to others and receiving and loving is really why we think we laugh at death because we feel that intensity. And that's wonderful. That's good. Bring it on. Keep on doing it. Joy, life, love, laughter is part 
of living that life well lived so that when we transition into whatever it is that we transition from this physical existence, we do it saying, Sabes que? I'm good with this, let's do this. Next slide, please. Using our inner strength, without a doubt, when we, you know, and the fortitudes when we move on through change and loss, without a doubt, these are challenging times, very fast times, yet life doesn't stop and it doesn't give us a chance to deal with our daily commitments. Mostly every person, I want you to remember this, please, has the innate capacity to survive the difficulty of loss. There are specific factors that help us and, and we move through this journey and we just talked about them, but healing and that adjusting and that recovery are possible. Next slide. Very quickly here, using our inner strength and fortitudes as we move through these changes, what can I do? How can I move through this? I don't like to feel this way. I want it to stop. The easiest way to get through grief is to get through grief and bereavement. So seeking the support of our family and friends, incorporating again, our cultural practices, ceremonies, rituals, etc., participating or taking part in our belief systems, whatever those may be, caring for your physical health, prioritizing time and space for our mental health. It's very important. Choosing options that support our healthy lifestyle, understanding we are resilient. And here on the choosing options, you know, we can all get angry and we can do negative options that are going to hurt us, drugs, addictions, gambling, and hurting others, being angry and, and taking it out on people. Those are not positive options. We have to be aware of what's going to help us move through this. Identifying and practicing healthy boundaries, as we spoke earlier, community participation and volunteering. When we give others, it's easier to deal with what we're going through. Understanding that we will drive on the road of loss, and this is a natural part of our life experience. Come to terms with the concept of change as a constant denominator for our life and live life with the understanding that we are fortunate that that person, that person that we lost or those persons that we lost, they were part of our lives. And that's beautiful. The next slide, please. Because they belong to us. The hardest loss is your loss. I have nothing to say, but I give profound, profound respect. And I try to hold space for people when they are bereaved and they are grieving because it's your loss, because it matters to you, because it's intimate and with all the dynamics that come with it, whether it was right, wrong, whether it was listed, illicit, whether it was healthy or unhealthy, it's your loss. And therefore it deems the honoring, the understanding, the experiencing so that we can move forward with this part of our life. Next slide, please. I think gratitude is the biggest, perhaps there's others, but I think when we give gracias, when we give gratitude to everything that we are and everything that we exist with and everything that surrounds us, it makes that pain, it makes that, that tragic melancholy and emptiness and that pit in our stomach, it dissipates it. And I think people, we have the opportunity as people to give thanks, to be in gratitude for those of us that uh, experience the experiences that we had with the people who have left us, who have died. I urge you to stay in a state of gratitude. And the way you do that is be grateful. I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for this. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be as tiny as the gum you're chewing, and it could be as large as your career or your mansion or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Be in a state of gratitude. It will take you so far in your journey of bereavement. Next slide, please. Any questions and answers? I think we're going through time here quickly, but I am open. We to... are, we only have one minute left, but we had one question, Elizabeth from Irma yes. Gonzalez. Uh, nice to see you here, Irma. She was one of our fellows from our Leadership Academy. She's asking what grief and law certifications or speciality programs do you recommend for current mental health therapists wanting to be experts like yourself in the area. And I can connect to you too after the webinar. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that is, that is a, that's a long question. It's a wonderful question. We're always wanting, there's many certifications in the country. There's many certifications uh, internationally. I can tell you that I have a certification through Mexico City Thanatology Association as well as here. There's just so many resources, but please Priscilla, if you can connect this, I'll be more than glad to yeah. answer any question regarding that. Sure, Definitely. thank you for that.
We need, we need our, our therapists and mental health people working on bereavement issues. Absolutely. Thank you. And that was the only question so far. So on the next slides, I'm going to ask my colleague to go to pass through them until the slide 39. So keep going, keep going, keep going until Elizabeth's contact information, please. Elizabeth was very kind. She shared her cell phone, her email address. So of course, we're not able to cover all the questions today. Uh, we were short on time, but if you have anything that you would like to check with her, directly, please feel free to reach out to, the, to Elizabeth. Uh, we thank you, Elizabeth, for your availability, for sharing your knowledge. We're excited for the upcoming sessions next Monday. Um, my colleagues shared the evaluation link here with you all through the chat, so we definitely need your help. Please take five minutes of your time to complete this survey because your, your opinion is very important to us. Um, next slide, please. And then the next one, we want to just share again about our conference website. Please access to learn more about the amazing things we're preparing for you. Uh, it's taking place in September 15, 16 in Las Vegas, Nevada. So we hope to see you there. Uh, we have uh, the second session of this three-part series. On the next slide, we added more information. But if you register for this one, you were automatically also registered for the other two sessions on the next upcoming Mondays. We hope to see you here. And then lastly, we're just sharing your our contact information with you. Uh, on the next slide, do you see the contact information of the ATTC? And then on the other one from the PTTC, we hope that we can clarify any questions that you may have. And thank you so much for those that helped us on the Q&A and helping Carlos. Uh, he had some questions about language interpretation. We had an issue uh, on our system this morning, but we reached out to him through email and uh, the live interpretation was fixed a few minutes after the start of this webinar. And this will be available since the start of our upcoming sessions. If you have any questions about that, about anything else, please feel free to contact us. We really enjoy having you here today. Uh, we appreciate Elizabeth's availability one more time, and we hope you have an amazing week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.